Our reading is from Ephesians chapter 3, beginning to read at verse 6. Through the gospel, the Gentiles are here together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Although I am less than the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God, who created all things. His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen, indeed. Let's pray together. And I will pray a prayer that John Stott often prayed before preaching. Almighty God, may your word be our rule, your Holy Spirit our teacher, and your greater glory, our supreme desire, for Jesus' sake. Amen. God's intent is that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known. So to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. So says the Apostle Paul in that passage that Femi just read to us from Ephesians chapter 3. And the major lesson that is taught in Ephesians 3 is the biblical centrality of the church. So says John Stott in his Bible Speaks Today commentary on Ephesians. God has not abandoned his church, he goes on. However displeased he, we, he may be with it. He is still building it and refining it. It has a central place in his plan. And then in that same commentary on Ephesians, from that chapter, Ephesians chapter 3, John Stott goes on to show how the church, in his own words, is central to history, central to the gospel, and central to Christian living, taking all of those points from Paul's words in Ephesians. Which means, of course, that if we take all of those together, what he's saying is that the church is central to the mission of God, because that is nothing less than God's cosmic purpose for all creation. Because if we just think about the letter of Paul to the Ephesians for a moment, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10, uh, Paul says that God's plan, God's purpose, God's great agenda is to bring all things in heaven and on earth, all of creation into unity in Christ and through Christ and under Christ. And then Paul goes on in chapter 2 and 3 to describe how through the cross of Christ, God has created one new humanity to fill that new creation, united of Jew and Gentile. One new humanity, says Paul, God's new society says John Stott. And then in the rest of the letter to the Ephesians, Paul goes on to show how the church must live out that unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace and shows us how to live in the world. So all of that is packed into Paul's great vision in Ephesians about how the wisdom of God and the glory of God are to be made visible in the church of God for the sake of the mission of God. And that's why the church matters. And that's why we've come to this uh, climax of our series, uh, celebrating John Stott's centenary with this theme of strengthening the church of God for mission. Now, this great vision of the church 
in the hands of God as God's new society was really filling the mind and heart of John Stott, especially in the 1970s which was when he preached through Paul's letter to the Ephesians, not only here at All Souls, but also at the Keswick Convention and in several other international events over those years. And in 1974, it all came together very powerfully in one particular sermon that he preached here that year. Because 1974, you see, was the 150th anniversary of All Souls Church, and John Stott had been rector for almost 25 years, and he wanted to hold out to the church, in a sense, a renewed sense of purpose and vision, just as we are doing now, actually, as we begin to prepare towards the church's 200th anniversary. And in that sermon in 1974, John Stott deliberately echoed the famous I have a dream speech of Martin Luther King Jr. from just 11 years earlier. And indeed, the memory of that speech was still vivid and the racial tensions that it had addressed in the 1960s were still very much around and alive in the 1970s, as indeed, sadly, they still are today. So it was a daring choice, really, to use that speech and those words uh, to craft a sermon. But John's point was that no human dream for society could afford to overlook God's dream for his church if one could put it like that. God's pattern, God's desire for the church that we see, for example, in Ephesians. So here then, here's what John Stott wanted all souls to be as a local church. But here also, of course, what he longed to see the global church to be, as we were thinking a little bit earlier. Because, you see, by 1974, as has already been pointed out, he had founded two of the ministries which are now combined within the Langham Partnership, the Langham Trust and the Evangelical Literature Trust for scholars and for literature going right back to 1969 and 1971. Because, you see, John Stott realized that strengthening the church for its mission in the world was needed everywhere, in a local church here in Langham Place and in the global church through the work of Langham Partnership. And so these two dimensions really always remained thoroughly important for John Stott. Even as his international ministry began to go wider and wider around the world, he always remained firmly rooted and committed here to this church, in this parish, in this city. That was very much a mark of him. So his dream then, that dream speech for his church had five points. And you can read them all uh, in the book that we've been emphasizing uh, over these last weeks, John Stott, The Living Church. Uh, probably the cover has gone into several different since this one that I've got. In fact, it was dedicated to uh, the, the three rectors of All Souls who succeeded him, Michael Bourne, Richard Buse, and Hugh Palmer. Now, although, I need to say this, although I'm using the words of John Stott as a kind of framework for, for this message, we've not lost our focus on the words of the Bible, because Uncle John would not want us to do that at all. Paul says, through the church and in the church. And so we're simply asking, what kind of church do we have to be in order to show the wisdom of God and the glory of God? And here's how John Stott answered that question in five points. He said, first of all, that we are to be a biblical church. I'm extracting some of the words from his dream statement. You need the full statement uh, in the book. It's in the back of that book. But here's the first one. He said, I have a dream of a church which is a biblical church, which is loyal in every particular to the revelation of God and Scripture, whose pastors expound Scripture with integrity and relevance, whose people love the Word of God and adorn it with an obedient and Christ-like life. I have a dream of a biblical church. Now you can see there, I think, can't you, this dual responsibility of pastors who preach the scriptures faithfully and people who love the Bible and are growing to maturity by believing it and living it out. Well, our brother David Turner here expounded all of that very thoroughly in his sermon here on the 18th of April, so I don't really need to say any more on that particular point, except to say this, that this was John Stott's dream not only for us here in Langham Place, but it also drives the work 
of Langham Partnership through one of the programs that was mentioned in the video, the program of Langham Preaching, through which, on average, at least 10,000 pastors and lay preachers every year in about 80 different countries are being given hands-on training in how to preach the Bible well. Here's a personal vision statement that uh, John Stott wrote in 1996 when he seems to have moved on from dreams to visions, but I suppose there's plenty of both in the Bible. So here's, here's what he said. My vision as I look out over the world is to see every pulpit and every church occupied by a conscientious, Bible-believing, Bible-studying, Bible-expounding pastor. I see with my mind's eye multitudes of people in every country worldwide converging on their churches every Sunday, hungry for more of God's word. And I also see pastors preaching with the word of God in their minds, for they studied it, in their hearts, for they prayed over it, and on their lips, for they are intent on communicating it. A biblical church. Then secondly, he moved on to a worshiping church. And this is the second part of his dream. I have a dream, he said, of a church which is a worshiping church, whose people come together to meet God and worship him, but whose worship is expressed not in Sunday services and prayer gatherings only, but also in their homes, their weekday work, and the common things of life. I have a dream of a worshiping church. And I wonder, did you notice again in there another double on gathering and scattering. Gathering because, of course, God's people all through the Bible and all through history are precisely that, a people who come together. We gather to praise and to pray, to celebrate, to lament, to strive, to struggle together, to share in the glory and sometimes the grief of our Christian lives and to do it together. And how Uncle John would have grieved over the way this pandemic has been keeping us from doing that, except more recently and in these rather reduced circumstances, keeping us from gathering together in the way that he could sit over here on the bench and this church would be filled and reverberating with the organ or the orchestra and a thousand voices just soaring in songs of praise. How we miss that. And of course, we thank God, of course we do, for our technicians and for all that we've been able to do online. But Let's not get used to it. Let it not become the new normal. And I want to plead with all of us here at All Souls or in whatever church we belong to, you know, to, to come back together again when we're able to do that, to be the gathered church once more. I think John Stott himself would have reminded us of those words of Hebrews, chapter 10, verse 25, let us not give up meeting together as is the habit of some, <laughs> but not a habit that we want to survive this pandemic, do we? <laughs> but the other side of this, of course, was that the church's worship doesn't only happen when we're gathered together in a building. It goes on, it goes out, it goes out into the world as we serve God in our work, in our family, and in the whole of life, as John Wyatt was reminding us this morning. Indeed, the worship that happens in the building is intended to strengthen and equip us for the worship that happens when we leave the building and go out as the scattered church on mission out there in the world. And that leads us to the third thing, a biblical church, a worshiping church, and thirdly, a caring church. Here's his words. I have a dream, said John Stott, of a church which is a caring church whose congregation is drawn from many races, nations, ages, and social backgrounds, and exhibits the unity and diversity of the family of God. A church which offers friendship to the lonely, support to the weak, and acceptance to those who are despised and rejected by society, whose love spills over to the world outside. I have a dream of a caring church. And I'm sure that we can hear John Stott's heart in those words. But, you know, that first point about unity 
among people of different races and backgrounds and so on is exactly what the Apostle Paul was talking about in Ephesians when he talked about the reconciling power of the gospel, bringing Jews and Gentiles together and ending their hostility to one another. Unity in a diverse church is in itself a living demonstration of the gospel at work. See, when the gospel transforms people who would otherwise hate one another, and even in some parts of the world kill one another, and bring them together in love and harmony and unity through the cross of Christ, and then the devil knows that he's defeated. Now, All Souls Church here, of course, is a large and ethnically diverse church. We all know that, and we rejoice in it, in our colorful international diversity. But is it sometimes possible that our caring for one another that John Stott so much wanted to see is just a bit confined to those silos of nationality or social background, just sort of caring for other people, other people like ourselves. I have to say that I was somewhat upset recently to hear someone speaking about another person in the church and her background saying, she's not really in the old soul's mold, is she? And I thought, friends, there isn't, or at least there shouldn't be, an old soul's mold. The only thing that should mold us is the biblical gospel. That's the one thing we have in common, and that should be shaping and molding us to be more like Christ, not just more like the people we already like. And then from that point, of course, John Stott went on, didn't he, to stress that the church needs to be a caring church, not just in its diversity, but in the way it offers friendship to the lonely and support to the weak and acceptance to those who are despised and rejected in society, as Jesus himself was, of course. And see, that's where the gospel really hits home, isn't it? This is where we show whether we've really begun to understand the gospel at all or not. Because the church should be the one place where nobody needs to be afraid, where nobody needs to hide who they really are, where it's safe to be honest about ourselves. And then as we do so, to be met with love and understanding. After all, if God knows the whole truth about each one of us, if God knows the worst truth about each one of us and still accepts us in Christ at the cross and forgives us by his grace, then surely we can embrace one another as forgiven sinners, as sinners saved by grace. Nothing more, but nothing less. I once shared with Uncle John something in my own past because I was wanting to walk in the light with him as he asked me to take on the leadership of the Langham Partnership about 20 years ago now. And after I finished my story, in some considerable trepidation that it might make him change his mind, he looked up and he said, welcome to the fellowship of the forgiven. See, that's, that's what grace does. And that's what the church is, the fellowship of the forgiven, the fellowship of the failing, the fellowship of the broken and the struggling and the grieving. Because we all have struggles in the church. <laughs> Some of us have struggles with the church, even, even this one. Because, yeah, let, let's not pretend that all souls is perfect. Of course we united, of course we are. We're united around the primary truths of the gospel that hold us together. But we all know that there are differing beliefs and positions and opinions around many other issues, more secondary issues of church life and church ministry. And some of those can cause a lot of pain and misunderstanding even among faithful church members and friends. And we need to acknowledge that. Even the Apostle Paul does. He says there will be disputable matters. 
But he says, let there be respect and care for one another as sisters and brothers. Accept one another as God in Christ has accepted you, as Paul puts it in Romans 14. So there are struggles. Of course there are. Some struggle with the loneliness of being single, while others struggle with pain and tensions in their marriage. Some live with sorrow of having no children and others are exhausted by less than perfect children or broken hearted by children who seem to be rejecting their faith. Some cope with unbearable pressures and stresses and dilemmas at their workplace while others are battling the demotivation of unemployment. And all of us, let's be honest, all of us are vulnerable to sexual temptation in one way or another. Some may be anxious about how others may regard our personal sexual identity. And yet, whatever that may be, all of us belong together if we are in Christ. In what ought to be a community of honesty, of truth and grace, of mutual acceptance, acceptance that's based upon shared repentance and forgiveness, a community of safety and love where all of us together know that we're all sinners, but we're seeking that transformation in holiness that every disciple of Jesus Christ needs and longs for. Well, that's what a caring church should be. And that's going to be tested here at All Souls in the days ahead, especially in that last area that I mentioned of sexual ethics, biblical sexual ethics. Because we are committed to respond to this whole process of living in love and faith and the consultations and this book which has been produced. Uh, and we are going to engage with this within the Church of England in this coming year. And we are going to need God's help and God's wisdom and God's grace to do exactly what it says on the tin, living in love and faith. Because that means we must go on both living in godly obedience to the disciplines of the biblical faith and living in godly obedience to the demands of Christ imitating love. And doing both can be very hard. And yet it's absolutely essential that we do do both, especially in this area, this minefield of human sexuality. To put it simply, we must both believe and obey what Jesus taught and follow the example of how Jesus loved. Loved so much that they called him the friend of prostitutes and sinners. And see, if that's what they said about Jesus, it ought to be what they say about his followers, including us here at All Souls. And that leads us naturally on then to the fourth element in Uncle John's dream. For, as he said, a caring church should spill over to the world outside. And so on to our fourth thing, a biblical, worshipping, caring, and a serving church. I have a dream, said John Stott, of a church which is a serving church, which has seen Christ as the servant and has heard his call to be a servant too, whose members obey Christ's command to live in the world, to permeate secular society, to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world, whose people share the good news of Jesus simply, naturally, and enthusiastically with their friends, a church which diligently serves its own parish, residents and workers, families, single people, nationals, immigrants, old folk, children, a church which has a global vision and is constantly sending its people out to serve. I have a dream of a serving church. Now, back in 1974, when John Stott spoke and wrote those words, the phrase missional church had not yet been invented. In fact, when I first used that word missional in John Stott's presence, he cocked an eyebrow and said, is that really a word? <laughs> he hadn't heard it before. He wasn't sure it really existed. Missional church. We use those words these days. 
And yet surely that is exactly what John Stott is describing here in that part of his dream. Because for him, mission was essentially serving. Serving God and serving others. Or perhaps better, serving God by serving others. In all kinds of ways and methods, spiritual and practical, including, of course, our everyday work. And as he often said it, as Christ came into the world not to be served, but to serve, so he sends us out into the world with the same mandate. And for Uncle John Stott, that was the very essence of ministry and mission. For the whole church, for all of us, as John Wyatt was reminding us this morning, to be on mission as God's servants in every walk of life. And I'm sure you possibly noticed two more doubles in that dream. Uh, very quickly, they are the double content of our mission, evangelism and social action. That is both sharing the good news of Jesus in our words and our witness and engaging with the changing needs of society around us in every area of social, cultural, economic and political life. We need words and deeds, proclamation and demonstration of the gospel. But then there was also the double scope of our mission, local and global. It's all in there. Because on the one hand, a church has its mission in its own parish, its own neighborhood and city, as All Souls has through its Serve the City ministries that Tasha was telling us about earlier. This gospel-centered outreach to the homeless, to sex workers, to trafficked women, and to every area of the secular workplace. But on the other hand, of course, every church of Christ has to have a world vision to lift up its eyes to the ends of the earth, sending, supporting, praying for those who serve across the whole range of integral mission in evangelism, theological teaching, compassion, justice, and the godly care of creation. That's the breadth of the mission of the church that needs the church to be strengthened. That's why this theme is precisely that, strengthening the church for this scale of its mission. Here's the second half of that vision statement that I gave to you a little bit earlier from John Stott. Here's how he describes the missional fruit of a church's biblical mission. If pastors are really preaching the Bible to feed their church, then this is what should happen. Here's the second half. What a vision, he went on. Week after week, I see people changing under the influence of God's word and becoming more and more the kind of people God wants them to be in understanding and obedience, in faith and love, in worship, holiness, in unity, service and mission. Or, as we like to say in Langham Partnership, we want to see the Bible changing churches so that churches under God can change the world around them. And that leads us fifthly and finally on to this last part of John Stott's dream. Biblical, worshipping, caring, serving, and expectant. I have a dream, he said, of a church which is an expectant church, whose members can never settle down in material affluence or comfort because they remember that they are strangers and pilgrims on earth, waiting and looking for their Lord to return. A church which keeps the flame of the Christian hope burning brightly in a dark, despairing world. I have a dream of an expectant church. Christian hope in a dark, despairing world. I mean, those words could hardly be more true or more needed than today, could they? When darkness and despair seem to span the globe in the teeth of this pandemic. And yet, yes, we live in hope, biblical Christian hope, which is not the same thing as just shallow optimism. This is not just sort of boosting ourselves and others with platitudes and promises that nearly always fall short. This is real hope because we know the story we are in. We know the story that the whole Bible tells us from beginning to end, from creation to new creation. So even though we don't know how that story is going to unfold just in the days immediately ahead, whether for the church or for the world, we do know how this story ends, as the Bible tells us. 
And so we look forward in confident certainty, that's what hope means, to the day when Christ will return to establish his kingdom and dwell with us as Lord of all the earth, the earth which will be redeemed and renewed and restored, the day when God will put all things right in the final judgment and then make all things new in the new creation. The day when the kingdom of this world will become the kingdom of our God and of his Christ and he shall reign forever. See, here's the thing. That's not just a dream of what might be. That's the biblical vision of what will be. So yes, we have hope. For this is the story we are in. This is the future we look forward to. This is the destiny of the church we belong to. And this is the church which meantime in the here and now is called to display the wisdom of God and the glory of God as we participate in the mission of God. So yes, we are an expectant church and we live in the light of our expectation. And one of our expectations in the very near future, next week in fact, is that all souls will have a new rector, Charlie Screen, whom we have prayed for and will continue to pray for, that he will lead us as a local church into God's future, just as John Stott and his successors have led us in the past. But you know, while it's been great to recall John Stott's I have a dream sermon, Let's not imagine that, you know, Charlie Screen is going to be a dream leader of a dream team, that we'll all pretend to be some kind of a dream church with some arrogant complacency like that. Of course not. We know, don't we, that we are flawed, we're fallible, we're full of good intentions and good plans and good aspirations, but we fall short of them pretty often. And indeed, to be honest, we are now grieving terribly and lamenting some of the glaring failures of the wider church and some of its leaders in this country and elsewhere. So we long for repentance and humility and renewal. Or, as John Stott put it in the preface to that commentary on Ephesians that he wrote all those years ago, here's what he said. The realities of lovelessness and sin in so many contemporary churches are enough to make one weep. For they dishonor Christ, contradict the gospel, and deprive the Christian witness of integrity. We seek the church's radical renewal. For the sake of the glory of God and the evangelization of the world, nothing is more important than that the church should be and be seen to be God's new society. Or as our vision here at All Souls puts it, that we should be and be seen to be all for Jesus. That is our vision statement. And it seems to me that in a sense, these other five marks of John Stott's dream provide the content. This all for Jesus, in a sense, summarizes all of what it means. This is what it means to be all for Jesus. And so, as we conclude, I suppose the question has to be, what part will you play? Will I play? What, what do you and I need to do? Which of these five marks of the church do you need to pay greater attention to and to build stronger in order to make sure that our church, your church, wherever it may be that you belong to as you're listening to us, is indeed a biblical, worshipping, caring, serving and expectant church. John Stott would say, all of the above and all for Jesus. May it be so. Amen. Let's, thank you, let's have a few moments of quiet as we reflect on these words and the Worship team will come and lead us in a moment. I will pray a prayer and then we will sing our final song. Just a few moments of quiet as they gather. O 
Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have not given up on your church because you purchased your church by the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, and we belong to you for all of this life, for all of life on earth, and for all eternity. So we thank you for that, and once again we come to you in humility, asking that you would enable us to be the church that you've called us to be, and to go out into this world, to live our lives in service and in care and in all of the things we have thought about, and to do it all for Jesus and for his name's sake we pray. Amen.